<clears throat> all right, uh, welcome everyone. So today it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Christina Zavaleta. Uh, she's a faculty member and assistant professor at the University of Southern California in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Her current research interests bring together chemistry, engineering, and biology to develop new nano-based molecular imaging strategies. And she holds a PhD from the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. So today she will tell us about investigating the translational potential of nano-based contrast agents for cancer imaging. So welcome again, Christine. Thank you. Um, so thanks for having me. This is my first time over at ISI, so I'm uh, very um, interested to learn a little bit more about what you guys do and how we could potentially collaborate. And I think um, pretty much I, I reserved the last part of my talk for um, the project that I think could have the most potential for cross collaboration here. So I'm going to sort of give you a little bit of a background more in the first half of the talk to uh, introduce you to sort of who I am and how I kind of came about to, uh, with regards to studying nanoparticles and their use in the clinic. So first I want to sort of do a little pitch for Michelson Center. If you guys haven't been over to main campus and seen our new building yet, this is um, USC's new initiative to bring together a multidisciplinary group of scientists um, from all different departments in one building with the idea that we're gonna try and push uh, biomedical research forward to sort of with, with the clinically translatable projects. So this is um, the new building. Uh, this was back a couple of years ago now <laughs> where I was able to, you know, tour the building with my little hard hat and everything, but this is the building now. Um, and some of you might have seen it on main campus, but it's quite lovely. And if <clears throat> any of you are in the area and you'd like a tour, please let me know, contact me. I have my contact information on the last slide. But this is essentially um, some of the work bench um, areas. It's meant to be open concepts, so there's supposed to be sort of this, not a lot of doors, you know, and walls. We want to keep it open so that people can flow seamlessly between labs and it sort of induces a more of a collaborative um, kind of uh, scientific effort. But now let's get right into the, um, the research, which for me uses um, nanoparticles, but I wanted to sort of broadly show you the use of and applications of nanoparticles in general. You can see it's all over the map. I mean, we've got everywhere from renewable energy to healthcare to electronics, uh, food agriculture, textiles, it's all over the place. So we're sort of in the biomedical arena off in the sort of contrast agents area. So um, within the biomedical arena, we're trying to use our nanoparticles as develop them as imaging contrast agents. So um, right now, nanoparticles, at least for biomedical applications, have sort of been um, focused more on in vitro techniques, so not really administering nanoparticles to the body for diagnostics, but actually having them in some sort of um, diagnostic imaging platform where you would maybe flow over some blood or urine sample or something to give you some sort of important diagnostic information about um, that sample. And nanoparticles have been used um, as ways to get targets to be identified, and then the nanoparticles would give some sort of signal. Now, for in people, nanoparticles have been limited mostly for therapeutic applications. There haven't been many diagnostic imaging applications of nanoparticles, and that's what our lab is trying to change. We want to push forward the diagnostic imaging potential that nanoparticles have. Um, this just uh, shows really the difference between diagnostic imaging um, based nanoparticles that are approved by the FDA versus therapeutic based nanoparticles that are approved. So you can see the disparity. It's, it's quite large. I mean, only four nanoparticles are really approved and they're not really approved specifically for imaging. A lot of them are used off label. So iron oxide nanoparticles are the ones that seem to have finally uh, crossed over to be used into human patients. 
However, that nanoparticle wasn't intended to be an imaging agent. It's actually um, an agent to, an, a therapeutic agent for people who have anemia. So who, people who have iron deficiencies, they administer these nanoparticles. But a lot of radiologists um, have been using them off label because they have certain advantages over the small molecules um, uh, alternatives. And I'm going to talk to you today about all the advantages of nanoparticles over their small molecule counterparts. But before we do that, I want to introduce you. Yes. How big are these nanoparticles? We'll get into that just in a couple of slides. They can be anywhere from, you know, a few nanometers to several hundred nanometers. And I'll show you sort of the relative relationship of what it looks like in comparison to its target, which is a cell. So we'll go into that in just a bit. But thanks for, and, and feel free to interrupt me. Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> um, with the, I just wanted to introduce you to the idea of molecular imaging because this is a really important concept before we move forward. The idea of molecular imaging is for us to provide physicians with more functional information. So when you think about imaging traditionally, you're thinking about maybe x-rays or some sort of MRI, something that's giving you more structural information. But with molecular imaging, we're trying to give physicians more functional information. What's happening at the molecular level? So in order to do that, we need to introduce some sort of contrast agent into the patient so that it can then find its molecular target, interact, and then glow for us and tell us where it is. So there's all sorts of um, imaging uh, modalities that can actually give us functional information. Even your more structural ones like CT and MR, even ultrasound, have the ability for us to give a contrast agent, it then home to a specific area, and then give us some sort of uh, contrast. So. Um, those are traditionally structural imaging modalities, but we can turn them into molecular imaging modalities as well. PET and SPECT have sort of been the traditional workhorses of functional imaging in the clinic um, because they require you to introduce a radioactive imaging contrast agent. So it's a small molecule, it's not a nanoparticle. We'd like to change that, but um, with regards to the small molecule, it is tagged to something specific, the radionuclide, it then goes and interacts and then glows for us in that specific area and then we're able to detect it. Yes. So all these uh, image can convert it into... Yes, these are all examples of a molecular imaging. So I call this sort of my molecular imaging toolbox because later you'll see that we're gonna start trying to combine some of these things together because some of them can give us better structural information and then we can overlay that onto the functional information, or we can have multiple functional. It, it just depends what the biomedical application is, what it calls for, and for us to choose something from our molecular imaging toolbox that is best suited for answering the questions. The slides showing the corresponding, like, uh, like the image corresponding. Oh, okay. So no, I don't. Um, so some some of these some of these uh, um, are actual animals. Like these are mice, for the most part. Um, I could tell you the MRI and the PET are are mice. The SPECT is probably a human, um, and then some of these other ones are probably more preclinical. When I say preclinical, I really mean mouse. It's just a nicer way of saying <laughs> mouse animal imaging, preclinical imaging. So what I want to change in people's minds is that imaging is not just a tool to look at broken bones anymore. It's a tool that we can use to help give more functional information. And it's a tool not just used in the clinic, it's a tool that we use as scientists to answer important basic fundamental questions about what's happening at the cellular level. So uh, that's something that I wanna emphasize here. But over here with fluorescence, photoacoustics, and Raman, these might be new imaging modalities that you might not have heard of before. Um, I'm not going to go into them too to, I, I, I am going to talk about how we're using them, but um, the principles um, are sort of more based on optical imaging techniques. So whereas on the left side, you've got CT, that's more x-ray. Um, well, that's from that's that's generated with X-rays, MRI generated, um, you know, using magnetic resonance imaging. Um, PET and SPECT are more gamma um, types of imaging. 
Uh, and then these are more of our optical imaging modalities. Okay, so in order to obtain that important functional information, I said we need to deliver some sort of contrast agents. Now, what's, those contrast agents that exist in the clinic right now are more these small molecules here at the bottom. So they're really tiny. And because they are that small, they have different properties than what a nanoparticle would have. So nanoparticles lie in between sort of the, you know, in, in this range where they're anywhere from, you know, 10 10-ish nanometers all the way to, you know, some people even consider 500, 600 nanometer nanoparticles, nanoparticles. There's different definitions depending on who you talk to. But anything in the 100 nanometer range is going to behave differently physiologically in the body than something that's really small like 1.5 nanometers. So this is really important because this is this is um, one of the advantages that our nanoparticles have, and I'm going to go into the, just go into that briefly here. So this is this to scale what a 100 nanometer particle would look like next to your 10 micron cell. You can kind of I do mostly cancer imaging, so you can imagine this as a cancer cell here. So if I have this cancer cell and I have my 100 nanometer particle, you can en envision that that nanoparticle is perfect in terms of being able to molecularly interact with all the receptors that would be on this cell. So we're going to get into, and I'll, and I'll show you that in just a bit. But it's sort of the perfect size for interacting with the cell at the molecular level. <clears throat> So other great advantages of nanoparticles, they're great carriers of either diagnostic or therapeutic agents. So now we can have a, de a delivery vehicle for therapy, but also have an imaging agent on it for us to direct or see where the therapy is going. So that's what we call theranostic imaging, combining diagnostics with therapy, theranostics. And that's a very powerful tool. Um, so you can put tons of different drugs inside, you could put imaging agents inside, you could put imaging agents on the outside. Not all nanoparticles have the ability for you to encapsulate things into them, but most of them at least have the ability for you to chemically conjugate the surface. And since we have a large surface area, it's easy to functionalize things for either imaging or therapy on the outside. So um, we're going to talk about several different types of nanoparticles that we've used in my career. Um, and I'll give you examples of how we've modified them to answer the questions that we need or to deliver what we want. Um, these nanoparticles also have multimodal imaging potential. And when I say multimodal imaging potential, I mean we can exploit different um, molecular imaging modalities in that toolbox that I showed you. So each of those Tool, each of those imaging modalities has advantages and disadvantages, and we could sort of combine the advantages to overcome some of the disadvantages. So that's really powerful as well. <clears throat> okay, more great things about nanoparticles. If you see to the left this single fluorophore with a single binding event, that's what I mean by small molecule. You have one fluorophore and one binding event. That's not going to give you sort of the imaging sensitivity that something with a bunch of imaging fluorophores inside of it and multiple area, uh, uh, multiple potential for binding, those aren't going to give you sort of the same sensitivity. So our nanoparticles have higher sensitivity, higher binding avidity, affinity. That means the ability to find its target and actually bind to it strongly. So that's another great example. More great examples. <laughs> Nanoparticles have a very special passive accumulation effect called the enhanced permeability and retention effect. So when you administer nanoparticles intravenously, now we're going to talk about different administration routes, but intravenously, if you administer nanoparticles, they can actually seep through areas that have disrupted um, vasculature. And areas of disrupted vasculature happen in areas of inflammation. Inflammation imaging is really important. And cancer also has areas of disruption within the vasculature. So they've got what we call leaky vasculature. The fenestrations, there's fenestrations that the nanoparticles can seep through and get into these areas of disease. And then because their sizes because of their size, they can retain. So that's what it means, enhanced permeability and retention. 
that's a really specific quality for nanoparticles that small molecules just don't have. Small molecules, yeah, can get through, but they'll leave in a, in a little. What we like about this is that they'll stay there for a longer period of time, giving us a, lar a longer um, ability to, or a longer time window for us to go and image. It, it's not going to be something like, oh, there's only a few seconds that it's going to be there. Like we can inject it maybe the day before even, and then come back later and image and it'll still be in that place for us. So that's a passive way that our nanoparticles are targeting these areas. So this is inflammation. This is cancer, so same sort of effect, passive targeting, seeping through, accumulating and retaining within those areas due to their size. <clears throat> they also have the ability to actively target tumors where we decorate the surface of the nanoparticle with something specific to cancer cells. So cancer cells are going to express a certain biomarker that normal cells might not express. And our nanoparticles can be decorated with these targeting ligands, like antibodies or peptides or something that's specific to the cancer cell. So we can now deliver our nanoparticles actively, not just passively. And maybe the combined effects could even, there's sort of debate within the community about which way is best to go. But let's say we're not intravenously injecting these nanoparticles. Let's say that we're administering them a different way, like topically applying them then the active targeting becomes necessary because it needs to find its target. <clears throat> so there's all different types of administration routes. That's another great thing about nanoparticles. We can administer them IV, we can administer them um, orally, we can have them inhaled, you can inject them specifically into the tumor if you'd like. There's all different ways that you could administer them. And we, we actually are going to use these different various administration routes to help convince the FDA that the nanoparticles actually have really good um, binding potential to certain disease processes like cancer. And um, the reason being that the FDA doesn't like nanoparticles because they have um, the they have sort of a bad rap because they have shown systemic toxicity or they have prolonged retention in certain organs. So this size nanoparticles the way that your your immune system gets rid of foreign bodies is that you have these circulating um, you know immune cells that then go and identify something as foreign and then they clears the blood and breaks them down in the liver and the spleen except some of the nanoparticles not all some are biodegradable some are not so the fda doesn't like nanoparticles that aren't biodegradable because they can sort of just sit around in the liver and the spleen for prolonged periods of time so we know that that's a disadvantage. How can we create an imaging strategy that gets around that? And sometimes it means by topically <laughs> or locally administering them to specific areas of interest. And we'll get into that. Oh man, I'm always doing this. <coughs> um, hold on, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is the first nanoparticle that I worked with as a graduate student. I just want to introduce you to it because it has very special theranostic capabilities, meaning that it has therapy and diagnostic imaging capabilities in one radionuclide element. So I didn't have to put multiple things inside the nanoparticle. I only had to put one thing, a radionuclide that happened to have a high beta emission for therapy. So that means it's high energy beta emitters. That's considered a therapy. Plus it also had gamma ray emissions, which is perfect for um, our uh, nuclear imaging. So we were able to uh, create this nanoparticle that had both therapeutic and diagnostic potential. Um, we coated the outside with biotin, which has a high affinity for avidin. And uh, that was intended to create this aggregating complex um, that if we were to administer them into the peritoneal cavity, because we wanted to increase retention of these nanoparticles into the peritoneal cavity for ovarian cancer. A lot of women who undergo um, treatment 
sometimes aren't getting enough dose to the peritoneal cavity where many of the metastatic lesions exist. So we wanted to increase our potential to treat in that area. So most of the time when you inject something IP, it will eventually be taken through the lymphatics and then dumped into the systemic system and then go to the liver and the spleen, like I told you. Um, but with our strategy, with this avidin biotin complex, they form these aggregates and they sort of get stuck in the peritoneal cavity and they don't actually have the potential to be dumped into the liver and the spleen. So this is a strategy that we use to enhance delivery to this specific area. And um, this just shows that there's no liver and spleen uptake that you would see normally after 24 hours. And we got to follow this out to five days because the radionuclide actually has a really long half-life of 90 hours, so that was really nice. Then I transitioned when I went to um, my postdoctoral training into something completely different, which was pretty neat because I had now an opportunity to learn more about optical-based molecular imaging approaches. And before, whereas before I was doing more nuclear imaging, now I'm doing optical-based imaging. So um, I helped pioneer an entirely new molecular imaging strategy. Raman imaging using nanoparticles had not actually been uh, done before, so that was really exciting. And then we actually used these nanoparticles that are really highly sensitive and have great multiplexing characteristics, and I'll talk about what that means. And then I focused on looking at their tumor targeting potential in small animal models, and then tried to clinically translate it into a tool that it could be used into the clinic. So that was sort of like a really nice project because I got introduced to something new. I got um, uh, the ability to pioneer something that had never really been done before preclinically, and then tried to transit, translate it to the clinic. So that was a really great opportunity. This is the new nanoparticle of interest that I'm going to be talking about for, for a little bit. Um, well, actually, for the rest of the talk, actually. <laughs> um, it has a gold core and a silica shell, very different than what you saw before, which was a liposome. The liposome has that sort of phospholipid bilayer that's very biodegradable, <laughs> biocompatible. It can break down really easily. This cannot break down very easily, and this is why the FDA doesn't like it so much as an intravenous um, route of administration because it'll just sit in the liver and the spleen indefinitely. So it still has great imaging potential though. So how can we use it to still give us the answers that we want without introducing systemic, prolonged systemic toxicity or systemic or just toxicity to the liver and the spleen? So this nanoparticle has the gold core. It has a Raman active layer adsorbed onto the gold core, and that Raman active layer can be switched out with all different sorts of molecules. So imagine having various spectral fingerprints like this one, but all different sorts that you can now deconvolve out and multiplex with. And that's what's exciting about this particular imaging modality, because no other imaging modality gives us the potential to actually deconvolve, deconvolve out several batches of nanoparticles. Um, the silica shell is meant to protect the whole entity, um, but it's easily functionalized, so we can put all sorts of antibodies and peptides on it if we want. This is an example, this trans-bis ethylene, par par paradial ethylene is a Raman active layer that gives this very specific spectral signature. Raman himself was born in India, and in 1928, he presented on this new radiation that he had observed back in uh, 1928. 1930, he won the Nobel Prize for this discovery of Raman scattering. And essentially what Raman scattering is, is the light in this room is actually bouncing off everything right now. And most of it's actually being elastically scattered, which means that it has the same energy and frequency of the scattered photon as the incident photon. So you shine light on some molecules, most of the light is elastically scattered. But a fraction, a very small fraction, one in 10 million photons are actually inelastically scattered. And that inelastically, inelastic scattering is caused by the molecular composition of the sample itself. So this is actually used a lot in chemistry departments for uh, analytical chemists to determine uh, what um, their chemical it actually is. 
uh, based on the molecular vibrations within the sample itself. So very small amounts are actually inelastically scattered. They lose energy, so they have a longer wavelength. The scattered photon is going to have a longer wavelength, and that's what we're actually detecting. So for instance, this is a very simple sort of Raman scattered plot. It doesn't have all the little peaks. Each of those peaks actually represent some sort of molecular bond within the sample. This is a carbon single wall carbon nanotube, which has a bunch of carbon which, which has a bunch of carbon carbon double bonds. And those carbon carbon double bonds actually give that peak right there. So that's just a very simple example of something that's very homogeneous, just carbon carbon. But most Raman active molecules contain a whole subset of different types of molecular compounds. So um, on the right here, you can see these are just four examples of different Raman signatures that have been put on each of the Raman batches. So now you have different flavors, I like to call them. These are different flavors of Raman nanoparticles. Each one can be coded with something different. You can send them all in at the same time, and then with one image, be able to deconvolve out where they're actually targeting to. So giving you a molecular map of where they are. On the left side is sort of a, another Raman imaging approach that people have used, which doesn't involve a contrast agent. It just involves actually looking at, at tissues <coughs> or, you know, various tissues in the body and looking at their molecular composition, seeing, okay, this tissue has intrinsically more DNA than that tissue, and that means that it might be cancerous or it might have disease. So that's an intrinsic approach. The problem with that is that Raman, again, remembers a very weak effect. Only 1 in 10 million photons are inelastically scattered. With our approach, the gold actually acts as a plasmon resonator. So now we're able to get magnitudes more Raman scattering than we were with just the intrinsic approach. So now we're actually able to see very sensitively these peaks here, where on the left, it would take a lot of laser power and time to actually get some of those signatures. So these, these are just sort of the differences. Man, I did it again. My end button is right next to my forward button. <laughs> I actually should be using that. This guy, OK. All right, so this is the very first Raman image that we ever took. <laughs> and what did we image? Well, we know that all our nanoparticles go to the liver when we inject them IV, so we image the liver just because that's where they end up. <laughs> so what we did was we had, sorry, we had a, um, a, a mouse that was anesthetized. We in, intravenously injected our nanoparticles and then saw the nanoparticles accumulating in the liver here, and we were able to image it. Oops, okay. Remember I told you that we have different flavors. Now I'm gonna show you, we, right now we have 10 different flavors, and you can see all of these on top of each other we can successfully deconvolve out each of these flavors. Um, and we've shown that in mice. These are spatially separated, but if you co-localize them, we're also able to spectrally unmix them. So now we're able to have all these 10 different batches, and now we can send them to different you know, areas depending on what, whatever we target them with, and then they're going to tell us where they, they are. Um, so advantages and disadvantages of Raman imaging, really highly sensitive. We can get down to the order of femtomolar, meaning we only need very few nanoparticles to actually arrive at the target for us to be able to detect it. That's really important. And then, of course, it's multiplexing capabilities. Disadvantages, low depth of penetration. So this is an optical imaging technique, remember, and optical imaging with any sort of white light, you're not going to get very far into the tissue. So if we're limited to five millimeters, we have to think of how we could potentially clinically translate that, and we're going to get into that in the next slide. Um, and then it's large, the large size of the serous nanoparticles, and then they all sort of end up in the liver and the spleen if you IV inject them. 
So the way that we get around those issues is, hey, let's incorporate our Raman imaging technique into an endoscopy system. So there's all sorts of endoscopy that exists out there, colonoscopies, bronchoscopies, like all sorts of uh, endoscopic systems that we could implement or integrate our Raman imaging approach into easily. So what we did is we focused actually on the colon because one, the colon is not a sterile environment. We could topically apply our nanoparticles to the area. So like give maybe an enema or spray locally so that we could coat the entire colon with our nanoparticles and then rinse, wash them all out. And then the ones that have bound, we would assume that it was due to the fact that we had active targeting. We also, what's great about the multiplexing approach is we also can send in a dummy nanoparticle that doesn't have any sort of targeting ligand on it to act as our non-specific binding. Because of course, like you're in the colon, it's sticky, you know, there's a lot of mucus, stuff like that. We can send in a dummy nanoparticle to act as our like background, like this is non-specific binding. So the idea is that we would have our endoscope, we would spray on our nanoparticles that have something that are actively targeting the colon cancer. Then we would go and rinse it and go in with our Raman endoscope, shine a laser on it, get a signal back that tells us, yes, it's targeting, no, it's not targeting. And then, you know, be able to help the clinicians actually get some sort of fun functional information. Because right now, pretty much a colonoscopy consists of a flashlight on the end of a stick. That's all that, colon that endoscopists are doing is putting a flashlight on the end of the stick and putting it in your colon and looking around for structural details. But they don't get any molecular information like, oh, this is malignant or no, this is benign. You know, that's what we're trying to give the physicians. So this is the probe that we uh, created. It essentially is a, a probe that will just give us spectra, but no images, right? Just like, yes, it's here, no, it's not. And we were actually able to administer this probe into an actual human during colonoscopy, which is really cool. What you don't see here is the nanoparticles <laughs> because the FDA is, you know, wanting to make sure that it's safe enough to administer into humans. So the FDA has really uh, made it very clear that they want a lot of different information and that's sort of stuff that uh, we had been collecting over the time. Um, now, that was sort of just spectra coming back. How do we how do we create a probe that's going to give us images? Well, we need some sort of rotational component so that it can rotate the entire um, length of the colon. Sorry. Um, so now we have this motor that is rotating a mirror that's now directing the laser out um, at an angle to circumferentially image the entire colon. And these are the sorts of images that we're able to get in our phantoms, where we have a piece of paper that we've rolled up into a cylinder, and we have the word spectra written in our different nanoparticle flavors. And so each of those nanoparticle flavors can easily be deconvolved. The A component has a mixture of all of them together, and that's what it's revealing in the image. So now we have finally an imaging endoscope where we can get now imaging capabilities for Rama. Now this is great, except we haven't put the nanoparticles in yet still again, but we have all different ways that we can administer them. Intrarectal is sort of where we're heading here. But since the FDA won't allow us to put any nanoparticles until we show in preclinical, meaning animal models, that we are able to um, get good targeting, we, we had to do, do a bunch of animal studies. And because I have experience with my, I go back to my molecular imaging toolbox and I think, okay, which of these modalities is gonna give me depth information because I'm optically limited here, I think, okay, well, I can radio label my nanoparticles with something and then get an actual um, tomographic image. And what we saw was over time, longitudinally, over 24 hours, 
when you intrarectally inject nanoparticles, they just kind of stay in the colon and they don't get systemically taken up by the liver and the spleen. So perfect. Let's send that to the FDA. Um, we also wanted to see what about an oral delivery? What if they were to swallow the nanoparticles? What happens? And what we found was when you swallow them, they go all the way the length of the GI tract and never go systemic. So they're not going to the liver and the spleen either. So now we've shown two different methods of where you can administer the nanoparticles to the area of interest and then not get systemic or have any sort of systemic toxicity associated with them. So, um, and we used ICPMS, which is the gold standard for looking at gold content, and it correlated really well with our, our PET imaging, nuclear imaging results. So that's great information to send to the FDA. I had been tasked with creating an entire FDA application from scratch for these particular nanoparticles so that we could try and get them into the clinic. It was quite a process, and I learned a lot of things. So nanoparticles are cool. That's what we're learning. Imaging is really cool. That's another great thing. The FDA doesn't like to administer nanoparticles to humans, <laughs> particularly if they're not biodegradable. And our gold silicon nanoparticles are not biodegradable. We found that out. But the FDA is routinely um, administering these nanoparticles for therapies. You know, there's bunches of therapies we've already seen. Um, investors don't like imaging contrast agents necessarily because the market potential hasn't really been demonstrated. So what if we used imaging contrast agents to actually help guide treatment? And by treatment, I mean maybe improve surgical resection or evaluating treatment response. Then maybe there's some money that can be made off of actually having these nanoparticles implemented into um, the clinic for imaging. Um, or what if we use imaging contrast agents to screen patients to prevent cancer in general? Then we bring the costs of healthcare down altogether. So these are the things that I learned and are now sort of, um, you know, helping direct my new research interests here at USC. And so what the lab is doing is that we're trying to focus more on trying to use these nanoparticles to help uh, guide treatment or to help improve um, screening. And there's all sorts of things that, we're, that, that, that they can be used for. So we're continuing to push Raman imaging into the clinic, except now we're going to try and help, instead of looking at colon cancer and all of that, that's just, you know my days back at Stanford, let's, let's, let's use what we learned about what the FDA likes, what the FDA doesn't like, what the market potential is, and help you know, redirect where the nanoparticles and how they should be clinically translated. Uh, we're also developing entirely new multimodal nanobased contrast agents that are more biodegradable, but I'm not going to get into that with this crowd because um, uh, I think the other areas are a little more interesting. And then finally, which I think is more, most interesting to you, is how we are able to assess these nanoparticles Physio, uh, on a, on a, well, their physiology, like what happens to them once they've been introduced intravenously, because we still want to understand like their circulation half-life, all of that, because there's still potential to administer nanoparticles, biodegradable ones, into the bloodstream. Um, but we need to understand things better for the FDA. So um, one area that we're focusing on now is actually helping guide surgical resection. So when doctors actually, well, when a patient is diagnosed with cancer and it's a solid tumor, the first line of treatment for a lot of patients is surgical resection. Like, let's just debulk that thing. Like, let's go before we do the chemo, before we do the radiation therapy, let's go and take the tumor actually out. And a lot of women opt for what's called lumpectomy, which is a breast conservation surgery, at least for breast cancer. So they want to take out just the tumor and not have a full mastectomy because sometimes the tumor is small enough and you know, manageable enough, and, and this is a way that a lot of women go. But the problem is that a lot of the times there's positive margins left, meaning that there's still tumor left actually inside the patient. What we want to achieve is something like this, where we have tumor on the inside and normal all surrounding the outside. But a lot of the times, maybe, well, up to what's been reported, I'm just going to say about 60% of patients can come back with this, but the chemo and radiation therapy could mop that up. 
but they might not. And sometimes the patients have to come in for additional surgery. Can you imagine? So what if we had a tool in the actual operating room that could tell the physician, yes, you got it all out, or no, there's still a little bit left, go back in there. And that's what we want to do with our Raman imaging tool is, okay, well, if you're not going to let us put in nanoparticles into the human, why don't we just topically apply them onto the resected tissue? You know, this is our new imaging strategy. Let's get around some of those issues that the FDA has, but still use the great multiplexing and sensitivity um, of Raman. So the idea is you would excise the tissue, you'd have a whole suite, like a cocktail of nanoparticles that each had different sorts of um, targeting ligands to specific biomarkers like EGFR, HER2, CD4. There's all sorts of biomarkers that are overexpressed on breast cancer. You then coat the excised tissue with this cocktail of nanoparticles, you rinse it, and then you have a device that's actually going to rotate the entire sample so that you can get the entire surface. And since we only care about the surface, the depth penetration issue isn't a problem anymore because all we care about is making sure the surface is clean. So this is what we're coining as Raman topography. You've heard of probably tomography, computed tomography, all these tomographical uh, images. MRI gives you tom tomographic images. Um, nuclear medicine PET gives you tomographic images. Um, that's being, being able to give you cross sections through the entire body. But what if we just want a surface map, like a, top, a topography map? We want to now get a surface map of this entire resected tissue so that we can see where the residual tumor might be and then redirect the physician back into the patient. So we're partnering up with this company, Rena Shah, who makes Raman spectrometers, and we're going to create this accessory device that is going to hold and rotate the tissue so that we can cover the entire surface of it and then give um, the physicians uh, a map of where the residual tumor might be for them to then, and, and this is something that they'll be able to rotate and it'll be a three-dimensional sort of um, interface that they can work with and navigate to then redirect themselves into the patient and see exactly where they need to take out a little bit more. Uh, we've demonstrated this uh, with human tissue sections where we've coded our nanoparticles onto different uh, human tissue section or human tissue samples and seen really nice um, correlation of our nanoparticles binding to that specific area. We have collaborators at University of Washington uh, that we're working with also who have done different targets. So we have done CD47, they were doing HER2 and saw really nice, um, so this is a really nice demonstration because they actually have tissue that looks like okay, that middle part looks like cancer, maybe the, the sides look like fat, but what the Raman imaging is revealing that towards the right, there's still a little bit left that they didn't catch. And pathology, which is the gold standard, actually uh, validates that there is, in fact, a little bit more to the right that, that wasn't actually taken. So this is becoming a very sensitive and specific tool to help guide and give molecular information to the physicians while they're in. And this instrument is meant to be in the operating room next to the patient. Otherwise, pathology takes several days to get, to get um, results back. That's the real problem. Pathology is great. It's just that it takes several days to actually process the tissue and you can't have the patient open for several days. So, okay, finally, I'm closing with this. Um, we have actually, since being at USC, come across a really new, exciting um, effect that allows us to actually visualize metallic nanoparticles like our gold silica ones, label free. So just to give you a little background about gold nanoparticle utilization out there, there's a lot of interest in gold nanoparticles because they have the ability to be used as diagnostic imaging agents and therapeutic imaging agents just because of the gold itself. The gold is highly absorbing. It can be used in a lot of imaging like photoacoustics, but that absorption also creates heat that can be used to thermally uh, kill neighboring things around it. So photothermal therapy agent. So it in itself is, has the potential to be 
a theranostic agent and it's been used in all sorts of um, things and has been approved in, in certain uh, areas for treatment of, of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, topical acne treatment, that sort of thing. So it's got a lot of potential. However, in order for us to actually understand the physiology of them, we've always had to tag something onto it in order to see it visually with microscopy. So a lot of people use fluorescent labels because there's all these really great microscopy tools that actually look for fluorescence. Um, and a lot of the time, or you could actually radio label it, but then you're not going to get microscopic information. Um, but a lot of the times you, these agents, I mean, they can come off and you're not sure, are you imaging the actual nanoparticle? You're actually imaging just the label itself. Um, but intravital microscopy, I'm not sure if many of you heard this, is the ability for us to actually see on a microscopic scale living systems. So this image here was taken of the ear vasculature. And what's typically being done is using an excitation technique that uses single photon excitation and looking for fluorescent dyes that have been administered either to the vasculature or to the added to the nanoparticle. This is the technique that's typically been done to actually see any sort of nanoparticles being administered um, intravenously. So it uses this single excitation, like let's say 525 nanometers, that's just an example of a specific fluorophore. It undergoes fluorescence and that fluorescence is what we're actually seeing in the image. However, more recently, several commercially available systems have offered something called multi-photon uh, excitation. And this actually uses, instead of the 525 nanometer uh, laser excitation, two 1050s. So 525, that's, that's half the energy together. And those two, uh, um, those two photons hitting a specific entity together can then still create the same effect as uh, the, the, the same fluorescence effect as the linear excitation. Um, but 1050 nanometer wavelengths actually allow us to go deeper into the tissue because it has a longer wavelength. So now we have deeper uh, penetration. Um, and they also allow for things like second harmonic generation and certain autofluorescence of the tissue to uh, materialize. So this is a new technique that's coming on uh, at, at more and more universities. And we have several actually over on our main campus so that you know in Scott Fraser's lab through the Translational Imaging Core. So what we found is that our gold nanoparticles actually undergo this broadband upconverted luminescence using two photon excitation. And what's cool about that is now we don't have to label our nanoparticles with any sort of fluorophore or anything. We can just use the intrinsic luminescence effect that's coming off of our nanoparticles to actually visualize them. That's huge because now we have an unperturbed environment of which we can actually see our nanoparticles traveling through the vasculature. So if you use the linear excitation that's been used previously, um, single photon excitation, then you don't see this effect happen at all. It only happens under the multi-photon um, conditions. And what we've been able to do is get images like this. I mean, this is amazing for someone. I, I mean, I'm really excited because now I could see my individual nanoparticles as they're traveling through the vasculature in an actual living animal. That's pretty incredible. Um, everything here is label free. So the vasculature that you see is due to an autofluorescence. The elastin collagen surrounding it, um, surrounding the vessels is due to second harmonic generation. Now we have an entirely label-free environment that we can now look at our nanoparticles in. And so this is an image of us actually injecting, and you'll see them flow in. Look at that. And you can see the direction in which they're traveling. This sort of information is super powerful, and I would think to some of you guys be really exciting because now we have, you know, tons of data <laughs> points over long periods of time that we can take in vivo, label-free, real-time. And this is super important on a fundamental level because we now can maybe interrogate other populations of immune cells and watch them actually take up our nanoparticles and see how fast they clear. 
now we can maybe manipulate the system and see if uh, we can increase circulation half-life, which is really important for delivering our nanoparticles. Um, the way that we, acute, we got those images is actually looking at the vasculature of a mouse ear. It's very thin. It's like sort of the perfect model for us to actually be able to visualize uh, circulation of our nanoparticles. Um, we wanted to sort of get some quantitative information. Can we actually track individual particles over time? So we did an experiment where we injected two different concentrations of nanoparticles, and then we wanted to see if we could visualize and quantify the nanoparticles in vivo um, and compare them to the actual concentrations. So the system that we have actually allows for particle tracking, so you can see the blue dot that highlights the nanoparticles here, and you can actually track each individual nanoparticle as it's flowing over time. So that's, that information was able to give us this data here, where we actually have uh, sort of half-lives of the, each of the different concentrations, two nanomolar and nine nanomolar. So the nine nanomolar is really, really concentrated, and it's showing very different sorts of half-lives as the two nanomolar, which is really interesting also. Um, but in the end, what we were able to determine is that, yes, the measured concentration actually matched the actual concentration by just acquiring this data over time. And the half-life increases as you inject more, na more concentrated nanoparticles, which is also really interesting. So what did we learn? There's several opportunities to exploit the advantages of using these nano-based contrast agents as opposed to small molecule agents and provide physicians with this important functional information. Uh, we're currently developing new Raman imaging strategies to help guide surgery. We're developing new nano-based imaging contrast agents that are biodegradable. I didn't talk about that much here. Um, we're developing new label-free imaging methodologies so that we can actually track our nanoparticles in real time and see how they're interacting in, in circulation. And, oh, sorry, this is, <laughs> I wanted to, you know, make, um, you know, the, the, the point that we're actually interested in, in having collaborations with uh, ISI specifically on that last, you know, project where we have all of this data and we could probably generate all sorts of new, um, you know, opportunities to, to collaborate because that last project, we've got so much data we don't even know what to do with. <laughs> So if you guys like data, we would love to give it to you to, to work with. Um, and of course, I'd like to acknowledge my lab and um, all of my great, I have some really great undergrads. Um, I have amazing graduate students. Um, we've also been working closely with the Fraser Lab, who has the Translational Imaging Center over um, on main campus. And we have all of these great microscopy tools. Um, and uh, of course, the Michelson Center and if you need to contact me, please do so at my email. And of course, if you want to learn more about our research, you can visit our website. Um, so thanks for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> it was very educational. Yeah, I, I, I wanted it to be because I know that, you know, there's different sorts of expertise in the room, and I can't assume that you guys, you know, uh, under understand, like, our particular imaging methodology. There's so much. So. <laughs> Anyone? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Sure. Do, do you guys know of anybody who'd be interested in this sort of, like anybody working within ISI that would be interested in this sort of information? Like in terms of like wanting this sort of data to... I mean, so, so a few weeks ago there was a person from the physics department who spoke about sort of similar so this abundance of data in material science patients. Mm -hmm. So we actually, our person, it was me who struck a collaboration with them because we're using machine learning to analyze this. It's, 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 it's this thing where we want to analyze how a fracture develops certain material uh, under different uh, load levels. 
Um, but that's the only thing that comes to mind when I, when I think of sort of abundance. And I personally do not know of anyone. We, Yeah. Yeah, like uh, unless there's some cases, data science. I play most time. I play with a lot of data. And uh, my focus is like social media analysis. So most time, I play with text data. I do like pick uh, out also relationship language. I don't really know how. I, I do play with data, but I don't know what kind of format the data will be. What kind of research question you can ask if you're using any artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, mean, I play with data, but uh, I don't know what, what the format the data will be and what kind of question you, uh, you, you want to ask by, by leveraging the expertise from artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the next step is for me to get an equivalent lecture from you guys so that I can understand what it is that you do and how you're, you know, uh, generating or manipulating the data. You say that you have a lot of data, so what, what, the data, what is, what, so, um, what kind of format the data is? Text or is streaming? Is like... It can be any of those things if you want. So, I mean, all of this is just intensity plots, you know. What are the questions that you're typically asking? So the questions that we, we want are, if we inject this concentration, sort of what is the circulation half-life? If we inject that concentration, what's, you know, if we do something to the system, do we get increases or decreases in circulation half-life? Um, are there patterns of the nano, like how are the nanoparticles behaving in different ways if we, if we do different, if we insert different variables? Mm -hmm. But mostly dependent on the circulation half-life, but there could also be opportunities for labeling immune cells to look at which populations are actually interacting with the nanoparticles and determining, uh, you know, how we can maybe distract them <laughs> from taking up our nanoparticles. So it, it really is just us putting different s scenarios in and seeing what the output is. I mean, conceptually, I think there is uh, an, an obvious relationship to machine learning techniques. But the issue is more like, is there a person who is into this domain, a sufficient domain so use machine learning? Mm -hmm. But yeah. Because I don't, I think I don't understand enough about what machine learning can do for me. Yeah. I mean, we can have a conversation. Yeah, about it's this. mainly about learning the patterns. Uh, and some machine learning algorithm is uh, in, is uh, explain them, but it will tell you like uh, which factor is causing the, uh, which factor like you have x one, x two, x three, which factor the y. But there's some um, also some. Fancy machine learning algorithm, like deep learning stuff. They just learn. Um, they just like uh, offer you a, a very high um, prediction accuracy, but they, they they serve as a black box. So they just of different kinds of machine learning algorithm. I think like I'm an expert to tell us what kind of question you want to ask and uh, what we can. I should recall that I also will play, play with some image data set. Yeah, but I just like um, scoring the, about the colorfulness and the, I will check colorfulness after the image. But most time for me, I'm playing with text data set. Yeah. Thanks so much for Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about uh, what we do in this, you know, predicting fraction. And if you see that there is some sort of an analog in thing. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>